I'm sort of very happy to be here. And uh, I got lost on my way almost, but I mean, eventually the guy came to the rescue, so I'm here. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, I'm here, and you will get uh, probably a little bit of a different treat that you would have got if Linda would be here as well, because, uh, well, we are partners, and uh, we are uh, a little different from each other in the sense that, say, she has more of an interest in landscape, and I have more of an interest in the city. So sometimes we meet in architecture, kind of coming from different paths. Sometimes it doesn't happen. And, uh, and the other thing that uh, uh, I think would uh, have uh, affected more what you're going to see is that um, Linda is very, very committed to uh, public work. Uh, you're not going to see uh, earlier work that we have done uh, for non-for-profits organizations that uh, had to do with uh, intervening in uh, underprivileged neighborhoods and doing small interventions that might make a difference uh, mostly in uh, public parks, uh, for example, one, and they were sort of environmental classrooms, say. Uh, so one was uh, on the edge of a, a pond, and so there was this issue of accessing the water. Another one was instead in the woods, and so kids would orient themselves and then get around and find out the specimens and so forth and so forth. So what I'm going to show you, uh, and I had uh, called the, this uh, lecture 2 plus 3, um, it's, uh, it's because uh, we're going to see five projects, uh, first two and then three. Uh, and that's it. That's, uh, you know, with Linda, uh, at times, we don't teach together often, and uh, we, uh, we did a seminar at some point, and uh, we couldn't agree on the title, so it ended up being called One, Two, Paradox, because that was actually what was going to happen in the classes. Uh, so this is uh, two plus three. And uh, uh, as you can see, there has been a little bit of interesting dilemma about which was the date of the uh, uh, lecture. But so we were a little bit uncertain until a week ago when you know, finally we sort of understood. Uh, anyway, that's a little bit why you're not going to get Linda, because unfortunately, she's somehow committed down there in New York. And so here I am. So you'll endure. Uh, let me, let me get going. Uh, so this uh, map of contexts uh, is uh, a way of situating the public work that we've been doing. Uh, so it's called agencies, institutions, and guidelines. And uh, uh, the layers of these logos uh, basically tell you the story of the agencies with whom we mostly worked, as you see, so the Department of City Planning, the Department of Design and Construction, and eventually for a little project I'll show at the very end, uh, back at the state level with the New York State Council of the Arts. Uh, the second uh, layer are uh, the clients, meaning the institutions or the uh, uh, public agencies for whom we did the projects, uh, not uh, the ones with whom you, we work mostly, but the ones that we are ultimately making decisions. Uh, I call the challenges the third layers, because there's always some agency which is more difficult than others. And uh, at some point, they enter into the process and uh, raise some questions. Uh, the next steps uh, indicates their, uh, well, the big stripe has to do with Queens Plaza that you'll see as the first project. Uh, the maxi thing is uh, quite different, but uh, it will refer to uh, another project that I will show you uh, after Queens Plaza. In other words, they are uh, the uh, relationships that we are working on and developing uh, in order to carry through the projects to another level of fruition. Uh, and the guidelines, uh, as you know, there has been a mayor in New York, uh, Bloomberg, who you know made a, quite a difference, having made serious decisions uh, in investing uh, by having intelligent people uh, leading some key departments and launching some programs uh, 
uh, of which we were lucky enough to be part. Uh, so we also participated in those general processes uh, in a sort of relatively informal way in the preparation of Plan NYC, uh, which was somehow the manifesto of this administration, much more actively in the active design guidelines, which uh, basically address the obesity epidemic and uh, say that both at the scale of the city and at the scale uh, of buildings, there is a possibility of encouraging uh, active movement. Uh, and then uh, there are, uh, you know, the, the guidelines that we worked on and uh, we worked on with, through Queens Plaza. Uh, that uh, is what I'm going to see first. Uh, inevitably, in an, um, in an academic circumstance like this, one feels the need to show, say, three references just to give you a sense of how we're entering an understanding of the city uh, in reference to Constant. Uh, which, you know, we consider quite simply uh, a way of opening up the discussion about the city, opening up an understanding of post-industrial conditions without necessarily uh, getting too much in the specifics. But the important thing is to sort of revisit a notion of the city and to put some emphasis on the aspect of transportation. On the upper right, there is an interesting diagram uh, by uh, a linguist that uh, basically establish this notion that, uh, that a word is essentially bridging these two streams that run parallel to each other. Uh, and the one on the top is uh, somehow the form of expression. The one on the, on the bottom is instead uh, the content of uh, the uh, word. In other words, uh, it is a way of uh, addressing, uh, sorry, but here. I'm still playing around with this thing. Uh, so in other words, it's the denotation of things that uh, uh, gets to be identified. And the, the relationship is open and variable. And somehow establishes this notion of language as a bridge between two uh, streams. Uh, the, the third image is a navigation map from uh, uh, the uh, uh, from the you know the, the, the Marshall Island Islands in the in the in the south uh, east, uh, which is very interesting because it is an abstract map. It is used in training uh, future mariners, and there is going to be a project that refers to that particular context of uh, seamen. And the way it works, uh, because they don't use stars, is uh, by paying extreme attentions to the ripples. In, this, in the water, in the, in, the, in the waves, and to understand where islands could be far away, uh, out of reach, out of sight, and not necessarily identifiable. Uh, the second one that I, you need to endure uh, is this set of diagrams. They are very known in sort of uh, theoretical circles. They belong to two important texts by an art critic. Rosalind Krauss, which uh, when uh, writing the, uh, the sculpture and the expanded field, which are these two diagrams, basically said, what is sculpture in the 70s? Uh, it has been defined as not landscape and not architecture. And the juxtaposition between landscape and architecture has always been played as uh, somehow a closed system of oppositions and negations. Basically what she said, wait a minute, instead of getting trapped in this square of cross relationships, there is a field outside of that. There is a field outside the dilemma between architecture and not architecture, landscape and architecture. There are practices in sculpture that somehow identify what she called site construction, marked sites, uh, and axiomatic structure as opposed to the conventional pole of sculpture. That relationship, uh, I recently discovered, uh, is exactly the same of uh, the one that she used in another uh, important text, which is called The Optical Unconscious, where instead she addressed uh, the visuality of uh, modernist perception. And basically, it is part of a reevaluation of the psychological imports of, uh, of uh, seeing. And uh, in that case, uh, you know, the, 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 the juxtaposition between figure ground uh, uh, allowed her to understand that within what seems to be a similar condition of oppositions, there is a tension 
that could be generated by what she called automaton of figures of absence that interferes in the relationship between essentially uh, an object of perception, uh, which is the figure, and uh, an object of desire. In overlapping these two diagrams, uh, basically one gets to this new diagram where the question about uh, what is architecture uh, starting from its negative, not architecture, and looking at this field that sculpture has opened, allow to rephrase some uh, notions that, in fact, are uh, quite important uh, in terms of uh, repositioning architecture, not in terms of an object in the city, but in terms of its ability to engage a larger environmental cycle. So, part one, the three projects are Queens Plaza, uh, the two projects, sorry, and the Staten Island Children's Museum. Uh, they engage the site uh, in terms of environment, uh, in terms of these larger flows within which a building is positioned, and in terms of the registers of wayfinding or renewable energies. So what I've uh, put here uh, as a slide, uh, use an analog of a mask from the American Northwest, where you see is the one that the Eskimo use invoking the spirits of a site as they go out and try to fish uh, in the tundra. Uh, and so this array of fishes and harpoons and so forth converge towards the figure uh, of a split uh, man-animal, and that is the way in which they try to appease uh, the forces as they go out. Uh, the uh, icons of the agencies are the icons of the agencies that have been involved in these two projects of uh, Queens Plaza and Staten Island. Uh, so Queens Plaza. Basically, Queens Plaza belongs to the inner periphery <coughs> of the city, and our approach has been to revert the direction of perception, not to look at the periphery from the center, but to look from Queens Plaza back towards Manhattan. And Queens Plaza happens to be on 59th Street. Uh, that is uh, along uh, a, a, a transversal street that crosses the river with the Queensboro Bridge, and arrives in what used to be, this is an image uh, of the turn of the century, in an industrial area. We also posit that uh, the space underneath the elevated at Queens Plaza across those railroads uh, might offer uh, a new paradigm of uh, urban space uh, in relationship with nature. In other words, might offer a suggestion of a different uh, uh, public park. Now, as I said, we ended up uh, dealing uh, with uh, various agencies, and I will undo this diagram step by step so that you understand how it somehow unfolded in the experience of uh, Queens Plaza. We ended up uh, being somewhere there in, in the center. Please notice, we're a small firm, so we were not the prime for you know, a, what turned out being a $35 million phase one project with another 20 coming along. Uh, that was run basically by a combination between landscape architecture firm, civil engineering. But uh, by positioning ourselves uh, as both urban designers and architects, on the one hand we dealt with the Department of City Planning at the level of strategy, trying to invent a different way of doing a project for a site so complex, but also as architects we could address basically everything above six inches, uh, which is quite a bit, and we worked hard to introduce some topography so that things could happen. So process-wise, this project, uh, in terms of its history, began with an ideas competition by the Van Allen Institute uh, that was already pointing towards a traffic study, which in fact was done after the, Depart the Department of City Planning in 2001 rezoned the uh, whole area and it was one of the steps uh, towards the Plan NYC in terms of what they were setting up. So this is somehow the beginning. And in fact, as I said earlier, uh, although the main agency that ultimately was guiding the financing uh, was not the Department of City Planning, is with the Department of City Planning that we enter in the relationship in terms of establishing a different way of making apparently was supposed to be a master plan. Uh, 
uh, and we pushed the diagrammatic approach as opposed to the zoning approach. Uh, and therefore, as you can see there, we tended to privilege representations that were embodying the diagram, so to speak, as opposed to the perspectives, uh, because the multiplicity of agencies suggested that uh, it's not necessarily the final stage, but are the operations that you stage and you set up through diagrammatic relationship, in part because the site is extremely complex, as you will see. At that same point, we engaged Michael Singer, who is an environmental sculptor. Uh, in terms of the diagrams you saw before, he is there in the area of the expanded field between marking the site and building the site. So it was very productive for us to work with Michael, and you'll see eventually what we did with him. So uh, obviously, one of the reasons why we got the job is because we said, hey, listen, guys, I mean, this place is cool. There is new green space, but you cannot ignore the elevated. The elevated is a big presence. Now, the elevated happens to be, as, as you were saying, a very active piece of infrastructure, as opposed to the High Line, which was an abandoned rail. And it is run by the MTA, the, which is a state agency. In the context of the initiatives of the city, the tension or the conflict between uh, city and state uh, cause a separation in the phasing of the financing so that uh, the ground has been done, and you'll see it in a minute, uh, while the elevated is still part of a process within which we are convinced that we're going to pursue what we call here as the vision. Uh, once you deal with the ground, then you also have to deal with uh, the streetscape. And so through this strategic logic of the diagram, basically we thought systemically in terms of you know, the lighting, the wayfinding, and the signage, mostly working with another agency, the Department of, uh, of, of Traffic, uh, while at the same time negotiating with the Art Commission, because everything you do in the streets of New York needs to be approved for somehow civic beauty. I mean, there's this group of people that really set the taste of anything. And if they don't like it, you're sort of gone. You can try hard. I mean, we had to try hard a couple of things. In any case, so um, back to the diagram. You get it now in terms of the sequence and the complexities. Well, as I said, uh, the urban context uh, is, uh, in the first place, uh, affected by this amazing engineering feat of uh, the Queensborough Bridge, which was the first cantilever bridge and the only one in the region, actually, as opposed to the cable systems of the Brooklyn Bridge and so forth. And it is a remarkable piece of construction, which ties into, as you can see, uh, an incredible uh, amount of elevated uh, subway infrastructure. Basically, the project follows the bridge to the upper right uh, across from the rail yards all the way to when eventually becomes a different kind of Baghdad. Uh, so that being the topic, uh, we decided, as I said, uh, to approach it through sort of a conceptual and environmentally minded way. We were lucky enough to work with uh, an incredible uh, firm of uh, environmental engineers from London, Battle McCarthy, who had already began to think in terms of different devices or smaller interventions that could address uh, the light, the sun, the noise, and sort of mitigate some of the situation. We tried to push that logic a little bit further. And basically, we organized these parameters for uh, urban design, environmental flows, and structure and light, uh, in relationship to which we invented this kind of notation, so to speak, that corresponded eventually in the cross-referencing by each of these parameters to new and site-specific uh, devices that would affect uh, this large site, extremely complex and, and very uneven. On the basis of that, uh, Therefore, there is not one plan, and this is uh, uh, the strategic plan, one of three, because the blue thread is the one with the most environmental agenda. And you see that the project is a mile and a half long, so it goes through uh, quite an array of, of, of site-specific conditions. So issues of pedestrians, transportation, seating, and wayfinding were sort of uh, marked in this sort of 
score uh, that is the top one. The second layer where the environmental flow, so how does one manage the sort of water, the wind and sun, the noise, and so forth. Uh, and you know, the different little icons, as you've seen in the previous image, correspond to specific operations or performances that some of these elements would be asked to do. Uh, well, then obviously there is the structure component and the lighting uh, that is uh, sort of quite fundamental. It was a long process. This was a major breakthrough uh, thanks to the Department of City Planning who understood this strategic view and sort of trusted that as the thing was going to be implemented, uh, we would be able to bring some quality. Uh, and they stood by that commitment. Essentially, the project is a sort of traffic project. So uh, there used to be an immense parking lot at the base of the curve of the elevated. There used to be an immense uh, public garage to the north that eventually has become uh, a development site. And the first phase, obviously, was to reorganize the traffic. You saw the traffic study. Well, then the issue has been to you know, do a project and make it into a very uh, special kind of park that is able to, on the one hand, absorb from the point of view of noise the presence of the cars that slice through that. On the other hand, to set up a relationship with the ground that would set up different conditions for social seating. And in general, to anchor uh, and to give a sense of sight in the face of this you know, big crocodile that you know, is sort of slicing through there. Now, the issue of noise, obviously, you cannot do anything with the subway. Uh, however, uh, if one were to take it in positive terms, uh, I think that uh, it becomes a unique environment. The fact that you know, every five minutes in the evening, there is this amazing light show of uh, a subway going by, which you know, might not help you talking with your friends much, but you know, it's, it's one moment of the reason why you might be in the park. Uh, it is uh, linked because of the role of the Department of Traffic with the general program in New York of the bicycle lanes. So it is, in fact, overall called pedestrian and bicycle improvement project. And you know, uh, some of you know, the different uses you see here, there are uh, areas of sort of social interactions. There are areas of sort of more defined passage. There are areas where uh, bicycles still rule. And this is the main uh, passage that, uh, that you see back here. You s I will show you later that there is an attempt to differentiate these different paths through the space in order to give uh, quality to some of those performative uh, parameters that we discussed uh, earlier on. Uh, this is uh, a view uh, in the evening. Uh, uh, the person is walking towards one of the paths. Uh, you see that uh, she's walking on a sort of metal grill, which is completely different from you know, the tiles and or uh, the asphalt of the other paths. And she's venturing towards what turned out being an amazing uh, discovery, uh, which is uh, what we call the wetland in this site, which is uh, an area of high grasses, uh, which uh, uh, by being less than a foot and a half below the public path do not require railings. And one nevertheless has this sense of walking into some level of wild, which is not just visual, interestingly enough, because uh, last uh, spring, butterflies were there. And you know everybody was stunned about seeing butterflies at the base of the elevated. Now, as I said, uh, Linda is sort of very committed to uh, understanding the ground and the landscape potential. She came up with this little model in a CD case, uh, which basically says, let's think about the overall area as a landscape using the topography and slice through that for the traffic. Uh, we manage working with DOT to convince them to transform for those areas that Linda identified, uh, transform their standard uh, metal edge of the curves, which are you know say nine inches or something like that, up to three feet. So basically, the, the metal of the of the curves as the the road dips into the landscape 
gets to be unusually high, and I think that completely mitigates the noise uh, as you are in the park area because they're down there. You, you see half of the car, all the noise of the wheels and the, the road is out of the system, and actually it does work. So that was an important move. The other move, as I said, in the context of the blue thread uh, strategy was to you know, identify uh, some components or specific applications of which I show here uh, the most significant, which is the one I was talking about before, uh, you know, that is the, the wetland uh, with its own filtration system, controlling very precisely the pitches of you know, the, the runnels so that eventually all this uh, area can sustain that particular kind of vegetation and allow that kind of experience. Uh, in doing so, as I said, we were lucky enough to w work with Michael Singer. Michael Singer uh, started uh, in the 70s uh, his career by making this very flimsy, very interesting installation in nature so that the notion of sculpture uh, was not in the gallery. It was not the sculpture of the heroic moves that would be documented uh, photographically then br brought back to the galleries as other environmental artists did, like Michael Heiser, or Robert Smithson, and so forth. Uh, he just literally did these little interventions like other environmental artists like Goldsworthy and so forth that somehow challenge the fine line between an object and its field. I mean, if we go back to the, uh, you know, uh, figure ground uh, or the sort of the landscape and construction, I mean, these are like tentative buildings in a way that in fact are so porous as to belong to a particular uh, environment. Michael also did larger work and started to move towards landscape and that's the reason why we could somehow catch him uh, and uh, is a particular interest in uh, water which was very important in terms of the overall agenda of the project. Uh, and it has a language that you can see here that, you know, uh, among architects we could also say it's a little bit uh, a la Carlos Carpa uh, in terms of, you know, complex geometries and uh, uh, sort of negative spaces that could sort of receive flows and so forth and so forth, which, you know, uh, might tend to become a little precious at times. So re-leaning towards the sort of the object-like uh, nature of uh, the sculptural uh, activities. So we, we managed to somehow work out with him um, a diffuse strategy, you've seen that earlier on, so that uh, we work with him in seats, pavers, and water runnels, in other words, in creating the social spaces for which we were working on the topography, the retaining wall, the benches, the, the situations, and so forth. And he would bring in his very textured materials. And uh, on the basis of that, in that context, create moments of intensity. That turned out like a, an incredibly constructive uh, relationship. Um, and I will tell you a little anecdote in a minute. Uh, in any case, here you see sort of the uh, a detail of one of the benches where, you know, the, the material, <laughs> this is obviously after somebody ripped off the first piece of wood and it was just replaced. Uh, it happens uh, anyhow. In this view from above, uh, you see what uh, I tried to tell you earlier with the big aerial. In other words, arriving towards uh, Queens Plaza, there is an array of different paths that set up very different experiences, and in relationship to which uh, uh, the social spaces function very differently. I mean, under the trees, obviously, there are little pods, say, as one climbs up the hill that ends up where the people are um, in a sort of little amphitheater. Uh, so that you gain this sort of elevation in the context of that space. 
is more like marking or measuring your progression as you go up. Um, on the main path, uh, there are the two conditions of being either embedded in the hill, therefore with sort of retaining wall function, or being cantilevered out, uh, exposed uh, in over the wetland uh, with the runnels that eventually you see are tying uh, the three that are on the right side. And then finally, um, in uh, walking through the wetland that, you know, also referenced again the presence of uh, old rails that used to be in the place. So there is a steel construction that is totally different from the others. Uh, and have a moment where it zigzags, uh, where benches sort of come together and make a little uh, space. Uh, and then a bridge that eventually connects uh, Queens Plaza to the space on the south. Um, this is just an image in, in, the, in the tree, under the tree uh, zone, looking towards the social space. Uh, and the amphitheater and the uh, elevated. The second strategy, inevitably, was to look at the stuff in the air, uh, so to engage the elevated. And uh, as I said, uh, this is an ongoing process uh, for which we decided to uh, change strategies as opposed to PowerPoints where you, you require people to come in a room and you have to speak for an hour and try to see what happens and then the agencies have their own processes and so forth. At the moment in which the ground has been made, uh, we could reach out to a new constituency uh, because essentially the problem of the elevated is not the capital cost, is the maintenance agreements because of the state versus city agency and versus you know, the presence of interests that are uh, business interests, residential co co complexes, and so forth. I mean, the project that was born as a sort of as a, uh, you know, development, promotion uh, took off. And so uh, now you're going to get uh, this one here. In the heart of Long Island City, one and a half miles of new bike trails and landscape will connect the East River to a new Queens Plaza. This video presents the conceptual design for the existing elevated structure, which will redefine a space long dominated by noisy traffic lanes and elevated tracks as an urban destination, alongside new development already underway. Phase one is transforming a sea of asphalt into JFK Park, a verdant pedestrian refuge. A major makeover for Queens Plaza, creating a green gateway into Long Island City. Right here where we are sitting, we will not have these cars here. We will have a canopy of gorgeous trees. At the ground level, vegetation, artist design paving, and social seating create a textured pedestrian realm, which also enables stormwater infiltration. The proposal harnesses the powerful presence of the elevated subway structure with three kinds of minimal interventions. Reinventing it from a tangle of steel into a wayfinding icon. The rooms are a series of glowing lanterns, brightening the trusses that support the tracks without interfering with their maintenance. The light lines turn abandoned beams at the lower level into a well-lit urban canopy for pedestrians and drivers. Where the elevated meets park and sidewalk, programmable media screens provide information about Long Island City and opportunities for art and revenue. Let's take a look at how subway riders, cyclists, and pedestrians will experience these interventions. Exiting the elevated at the Queensboro Plaza station, passengers will see the glowing rooms leading pedestrians and cyclists towards the new JFK Park. New planted medians offer protected passage for pedestrians and cyclists. The elevated structure design project also clarifies the approach to Queens Plaza from Jackson Avenue. The intersection between Jackson Avenue and Queens Boulevard appears particularly chaotic and dark. 
The glowing steel mesh of the light lines will orient drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians across the busy intersection. Lit from within, the light lines will announce subway passages overhead. Below the Jackson Avenue intersection is the concourse of Queens Plaza subway station, from which riders emerge to encounter the overwhelming presence of the elevated on Queens Plaza South. Here, phase one of the Gotham Center development is under construction. The new 21-story office tower will face the elevated structure. One of the two media screens will contribute to the identity of the surrounding community providing information about life in Long Island City, celebrating Queens Plaza as a unique post-industrial metropolitan gateway and exemplary 21st century park. The goal of the elevated structure design proposal is to fulfill the vision of the overall Queens Plaza project, integrating the new roadways, landscape elements, and pedestrian spaces with historical metropolitan infrastructure. The proposed three kinds of interventions, the rooms, the light lines, and the media screens will bring to Long Island City the excitement of Times Square and the green spaces of Central Park in a single place both active and welcoming. They celebrate Queens Plaza's historical legacy with maximum effect on public space. So yes, uh, this was made uh, precisely in order to reach out in a completely different way and uh, reconstruct a different constituency. It's on Vimeo. Uh, so everybody can go see it. Uh, and in fact, it, it has worked quite incredibly in terms of uh, uh, the sort of the, the, the rethinking uh, of, uh, uh, of the project. Uh, so I'll show you just one final image about it, which is uh, uh, in the empty portion of the Gotham Center development, we are working with the developers, with the social groups that want to use it temporarily for events, using uh, the elevated also for projection uh, uh, over there. I think I will pick up uh, speed here. Uh, I will show you the other projects. Uh, I wanted to sort of honor Queens Plaza. Uh, this is for the Staten Island Children Museum. It's a project we did uh, with the Department of Design and Construction as a facilitating agency and the museum, uh, which is uh, in Snug Harbor, uh, which is the house for retired seamen in uh, the uh, Bay of New York. Uh, one of the two elements that we were asked to do is uh, a, a tent structure in the meadow in front of the museum. We involved uh, the community in painting the construction fence and having some information as the thing was coming along. Uh, eventually, uh, it got uh, to be a, a new focus within the overall campus that uh, <coughs> works quite well through this process of appropriation that also including the uh, the elevated. Now, the, the point is that uh, the, the scope is uh, relatively modest in the sense of making this tent and fixing two leaky skylights in the building. However, uh, we thought in line with another aspect of the agenda of the administration that, uh, that was to introduce uh, a fairly substantial uh, environmental agenda. So we wanted to experiment uh, in the metal structure engaging uh, the sun uh, in uh, the two skylights of the building engaging the wind, seeing those two forces and flows as typically of that particular place, uh, and then connecting them in relationship with a display uh, that is within the museum. So uh, you see here a couple of images of the metal structure, but uh, probably this is the significant slide where you know we work with a structural engineer, Weinlinger, in order to model and find the, the sort of the optimum angle of the southern facing uh, ridged aspects of this. So instead of making the super tent, we did this thing which is a little bit gothic if you want in order to maximize the number of surfaces. And with uh, another engineer, we worked out all the solar fabric. Now, this is the first time that ever is being installed on a tensile structure, solar fabric, which is soft, 
obviously, and can follow the double curvature. It is a demonstration project, so it's not necessarily going to sort of fix the lighting of the whole campus. But, I mean, it is sort of distributed in a certain way. And uh, uh, you see that there are individual pieces of different lengths that are sort of connected to each other, and then the wires uh, find their way uh, to a, a space where there is the batteries and all the other uh, electrical stuff. As I said, in one of the skylight, we pushed, and we were very fortunate to be able to get uh, a vertical axis turbine from Finland, because they are kind of quite ahead of uh, engineering in terms. We try hard to have something uh, built in this country, but somehow. The point being that uh, the vertical axis turbine are perceived as solid by the birds. And in a chiller museum, it's sort of good that a turbine wouldn't kill the birds. And so, you know, it, it does something over there. We build special structures, the skylights, in order to address the particular mode of installation of this. And <laughs> this was the funny part. We somehow engaged with uh, this uh, America Cup boat builder uh, in Rhode Island, Goetz Boat, uh, to do for us the wind scoop, the rotating wind scoop, uh, which is this strange fish. Uh, that has the function, because of the negative pressure under the tail, so to speak, as it rotates, uh, extracts hot hair from the main stair, which was not conditioned. At the same time, by rotating, indicates the direction of the wind in this sort of brightly colored uh, drum, which is, as well, on top of the main stair. So there they are, uh, finally arriving. Funny duo. And this is somehow the diagram where, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the third floor exhibit, how you build the house, is the most popular in the museum. I mean, you know, they all go there, they sort of hammer away, they excavate, they do stuff and whatever. So we felt that it was good to bring in, you know, a 21st century agenda through renewable energy. And so the information that comes from the tent and the information that comes from the turbine converges on the landing uh, of the third floor where we, there, we, there is the first of two interactive display stations. The other one being <laughs> from the two by four little house with the shingles and whatever in the how you make a house where we opened up uh, a truss on the stair so that it becomes another viewing platform and there is a dialogue between kids. Uh, in that sense, we are uh, finalizing with uh, deck monitoring, which is a company in Portland, uh, basically, the interactive display storyboard so that the kids can sort of touch the screens and ask questions and find out what's going on, what's being produced, and so forth and so forth. And then eventually, there is going to be also a demonstration thing with a bulb with, the, with their phone chargers and stuff like that. In any case, this is uh, uh, the drum. Uh, and that's the light that it casts on the window uh, in the uh, uh, home exhibit. And <laughs> believe it or not, it moves. I mean, you know, we really thought that the wind scope would not move at all because, I mean, you know, it's huge, whatever, you know, we've never done anything like that. But, you know, Mr. Goetz, who does this racing boat, said, eh, eh, relax. I mean, you know, he said, no, but the tail is too long. It's gonna, uh, no, 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 relax. I mean, and he had this sort of, you know, ball bearing you know, carriers, and you, you put quite a bunch of that. It makes noise because the track is sort of, you know, built by a, a sort of a builder from, you know, Staten Island, so it's a kind of a little rickety, but <laughs> <laughs> however, these things here do, and, you know, and uh, as you might have seen, he was kind enough to give us the model of uh, one of his favorite uh, racing boats as the indicator of where the wind comes from, uh, and that's what it is. So, sorry to go back to the, now we're going to the last three. Uh, I think that I'm going slow, so I'll keep on pick up in speed. Essentially, from that conditions of architecture being here in this negative pole and the expanded field being there, but understood in terms of operations, the issue in terms of diagrams is if you think about them not as printed matter, which is the way they usually come in theory books, but as sort of dynamic apparatuses, you can establish through this figure, the climb bottle, which is, you know, a, a 4D 
topological figure that has no interior, no exterior. It is a continuous flow of inversions, basically, between architecture and the expanded field, essentially. And through this sort of moment of the imaginary uh, axis where uh, there is a sort of a switch in logic that allows you to engage uh, that. And you know, in terms of the, the next three projects, in terms of the analog, uh, uh, as opposed to a mask that invokes the, 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 the powers of, of the site, there are masks in which one celebrates the, the lineage, the, 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 the identity of the, 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 the group, and establishes a direct connection with uh, a mythical animal uh, through sort of the opening of the mask in the middle of sort of the foggy dances or the potlatches. So, uh, so the three projects are about identity, history, and installation. You understand it's not directly about the environment. We were trying to divide them. So uh, the one in the middle, Bolton Landing, is not for a public agency. It is uh, the renovation of the studio, the sculpture of David Smith, which is almost complete, upstate New York. And the last one is a small installation that was done a few years ago at the Empire State uh, Plaza at the capital of the state of New York, uh, where I think we will try to wrap up some of the elements. This is a, the biggest project for us. It's a new library building under construction in Queens. Uh, essentially, it replaces a Carnegie building that was made uh, part of the sort of uh, 1700 that were built in this country of Carnegie. It's an amazing program where the, the community had to offer the site, and they had a bunch of types. This one is sort of the, some pseudo-Georgian version on the relation with the uh, sort of uh, uh, De La Brousse, uh type of the sort of straight, straight entry. And you would enter an axis. You would have all this process of intimidation in relationship with the librarian. Uh, obviously, things are different. Uh, over 100 years, a big building got built and obscured the park and the, the library on Broadway. And, you know, inevitably, a library is no more what it was. And Queens and that particular neighborhood is amazing in terms of its uh, combination between the mix of ethnicity, the languages. Uh, and it is, therefore, more than a conventional library. So we threw it down. But because of this uh, importance, historical affection, uh, intense relationship that this library had with the neighborhood, we decided to salvage the bricks from demolition, and they're going to reappear uh, as a memory trace somewhere. So we s finally started. I mean, I cannot, yeah, I'm not going to tell you how long it takes, but I mean, forever. It's, uh, here we go. I mean, uh, Linda mostly work on these active design guidelines, which I uh, explained briefly have to do with uh, sort of encouraging movement. So the notion here is that uh, you know, the circulation spine of the building is an extension of the sidewalk. And then there is a system of wayfindings uh, that directs to the different aspects of the program. Uh, here's uh, the footprint. Uh, among other challenges, uh, this building is in mud, essentially. So it's like a battleship or a submarine, kind of floating in there with this sort of big tub. Uh, but you know the pressure of program and our commitment of maintaining the scale in relationship with the leftover of that park in the corner, which is an important corner in the neighborhood, uh, uh, somehow you know led us to uh, this particular uh, footprint, which is also predicated on the possibility of adding another 15,000 square feet on the upper right uh, towards the edge of, of the lot. So uh, there are a few things. So here you go. I mean, the idea is basically to give, again, visibility to the building on Broadway. And to have these two main reading rooms, which somehow fulfill this notion of the transparency and so forth, they are very different from each other. They are, in a way, performing very differently, although they're very similar. And this issue of the identity and the difference it is very, very important within processes of cultural assimilation. So it gets to be staged at the level of the sort of the main architectural features. Uh, and you will see, I mean, obviously one is cantilevering in Broadway over the main entrance. The other one is in the middle of the park, like a pavilion in the park, uh, which is somehow the main reading room. It's coming along. So there we go. Uh, 
The important thing is that in a sort of no build area due to the rear yard zoning, we launched this notion of the learning garden. Linda has been working very, very hard in uh, helping Queens Library uh, to identify the areas around the buildings that have been completely unused and now with Wi-Fi and programs and all this expansion of the role of libraries in terms of community centers, they become places where the kids can go there, they can grow uh, you know, the, 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 the plants, they become program of education, they become something completely different. So it's, there it is. Uh, as I said, it works much more uh, uh, than a standard hour of the library. So that, the, the, you know, the night entry is next to the main queue that reminds lit uh, in the evening, uh, which is this one. Uh, with uh, the main stair that has this notion of climbing on a pile of books, essentially finding yourself exactly where the old Carnegie door used to be. And so you have a completely different relationship with your access to culture, so to speak, from which you take off with this uh, rather unique stairs in which basically the railing is the structure. Uh, and you see here is just uh, a folded plate. Uh, the railing is a truss and basically is able to span this distance uh, you know, with a very, very, very light, transparent perception. Basically, no stringer on the inside as you look out towards the park. Above, there's sort of some serious beams in order to make the whole thing completely open and cantilever. Uh, we're lucky to work with Severod Engineering, which is a very, very good structural engineer. And here, looking back from the main stair towards uh, Broadway, uh, as I said, I mean, this notion that the nature-culture tension that you know, was part of the general diagrams and the two cubes and this, their role in terms of what they do in the park and on Broadway is important also because Elmhurst, which is the name of the neighborhood, as it was named after Elm trees, and you know that there was a Dutch Elm disease, so they all died. Uh, but there is the trace of these photos of the old Carnegie with this tree. So this notion that there is a relationship which is real and virtual with the presence of tree became to be pushed very hard on the Broadway Cube, which is facing one of the oldest buildings in Queens, the St. James uh, Church, uh, by reconstructing kind of a birdhouse, which is all made in elm wood, and also putting in there the artwork uh, of uh, Alan McCollum, which is a conceptual artist that we work with in terms of setting up, as you see here, uh, both the access of history, which we want to be non-nostalgic, framed in this way, and through the presence of Elm, very explicitly sort of reframed, and with the work of his, which is the Shapes program. Alan is a very tough guy. I mean, he's one of those critical, the critique of the institution guys that in the 70s and 80s would fill up galleries with black painting, kind of say, forget about it, this is a sort of a crooked system, and we want to identify the potential critical role that art can play in relationship with the institution. Obviously, by now, you know, it's like the Cindy Sherman, the Richard Prince, I mean, all that sort of particular group of artists that sort of broke, so to speak, the system, in other words, that beyond the phenomenological aspect of experience, also brought in so the intellectual, the imaginary, the cultural, the sort of uh, production of, uh, and he does these amazing things, which are you know, uh, based on multiples, um, immense productions uh, that you know, uh, have this continuous dilemma uh, of subverting somehow the pop object and making it into a product that gets to be uh, uh, incredible, or through the shapes to play on this issue of the identity and the difference, having people understanding how it works. Or, it so happened in Sweden, he made this uh, uh, amazing uh, collection of uh, cast concrete elm roots that seem to be kind of pertinent, considering what we were trying to do. Uh, so. Uh, it's a systemic way of thinking about art making. So there is tops and bottoms that get to be combined. And uh, as the project gained more budget, we basically managed to uh, 
convinced the Public Design Commission that we could do something more beyond the piece of art in the cube that you've seen before, and therefore to engage the sort of this way of coming together precisely in relationship with the main vertical circulation because of that emphasis on active design. So at the end of the day, I mean, there are the seven, 600 shapes that you see from the street that become like a lure against this giant brick wall, but we also have the tops and the bottoms in the ceiling of the elevators, which obviously never meet each other, so they always miss each other. While if you take the stair on the top, you have this sort of moment of somehow creation and gathering uh, that comes together. This is the project we're, we're doing for the renovation of David Smith's studio, upstate New York. It was a famous sculpture that invented welded sculpture. And he had this idea of making, essentially, uh, a factory in the middle of the sublime. This is part of a, an installation that is now at the Maxi. Smith sculpture did not call for a conventional artist studio. We wanted to explain his relationship with the studio and somehow our project. The terminal ironworks. It was there that he took his welding equipment, his supply of materials, and went to work. In 1941, Smith moved to an abandoned fox farm at Bolton Landing in upstate New York. He took the name Terminal Ironworks and applied it to a new studio he built there in the mountains above Lake George. In the American wilderness, he established a factory atmosphere where he could concentrate almost entirely on his sculpture. I try to approach each thing without following the pattern that I made with the other one. They can begin with any idea. They can begin with a found object. They can begin with no object. They can begin sometimes even when I'm sweeping the floor and I stumble and kick a few parts that happen to throw into an alignment that sets me off in thinking and sets off a vision of how it would finish if it all had that kind of accidental beauty to it. I want to be like a poet, in a sense. I don't want to seek the same orders. The poetic range of Smith's work required an equally broad range of materials. My studio, my house, my trees, the nature of the world I live in. He was an amazing producer in his factory, uh, and he didn't want to sell his work. So when he died in a car accident, as those guys used to do, uh, uh, the fields of David Smith were absolutely amazing, full of his sculptures. And uh, this was filmed uh, soon after his death uh, with some of these pieces that become our references. This is called uh, Primo Piano, uh, and it's uh, still there, and it is a very powerful piece. Our project establishes a dialogue with the temporal flow of Smith's work as the building parallels the development of his iconic modernist sculpture. Part of his artistic agenda was to construct a machine in the garden a factory surrounded by wild nature. In 1941, he assembled steel joists for the building's roof, a north-facing skylight, and cinder blocks to enclose its interior. From his office, he looked at the Adirondack's sublime forest and the fields rolling downhill towards Lake George. Smith reasserted the rough industrial character of his studio when he doubled its size in 1958. Again in 1962, he used the same materials to unify the building's facade, enlarging the structure to its current footprint. Our project reframes Smith's own construction work, also addressing the transformations introduced by family members after his death. We have recycled the building as a whole under a single roof. The party wall highlights layers of archaeological traces. A meditation room floats against the glass block. A huge fireplace still occupies the center of the living space. The perimeter wall opens up towards the landscape, repositioning the building in its site. New and renovated elements project the new spaces towards the fields and a spring-fed pond. 
At the historical party wall, the project reopens blocked passages and defines new thresholds for the private areas. Smith's creative universe enters into a dialogue with the metal-clad meditation room and a recycled wood volume in front of it. Transformation of the workshop into inhabitable space is emphasized by preserving the 1972 stone fireplace. The corner office is opened up, reframing a landscape still graced by the products of a prodigious creative output, which once inhabited the fields of David Smith. So, uh, the project is under construction, and this video was part of the installation that is now in Rome at the Maxi. Uh, I will show you in a sec if you have five minutes of patience. Maybe? I, I'm in I mean, it's just, five you're, you're, in, you're in charge. I mean, yeah. uh, so, uh, well, uh, at the image of the fields of David Smith, uh, the, the, we are going to introduce something that uh, you'll have to suffer through soon. Um, in any case, a couple of photos just to give some credibility to the fact that it's being built. Uh, that's the capsule uh, with the sort of stair that go up. Uh, the person on, on the left is uh, uh, David's daughter, Becca, which is an amazing client. She took a chance of walking back again into this very charged space to sort of address it. Uh, that's a desk, which is in front of the metal, which has sort of a bunch of sort of interesting uh, steel detail, and this eventually is the corner. Uh, so it's now in this show, which is about the Italian architects abroad uh, at the Maxi, where we were asked to show this work, uh, which we decided to make it as an installation as opposed to an object model, somehow participating to the larger installation that Lotec has made for uh, other younger architects that are part of the show. Uh, and it is like this strange freestanding animal that uh, takes a stroll in the gallery and tries to challenge or open up some conversation about the modes of representing architecture in a museum also by bringing in real material from the site and uh, introducing multiple scales and this continuous oscillation between the real and the representational because at the very moment in which this building is being realized, somehow it so happened that if you open the section it looks like a musical score which we tend to like in general, as in Queens Plaza, although it's not necessarily uh, Mozart. Uh, so uh, we have the models, and on the shelf where the other models of other architects are, in fact, we have leaves and uh, a video, which is the one that you just saw. Uh, and uh, we are trying to, again, explain what we're doing. Uh, and we are working now, you'll excuse the fact that this is um, a rough draft, but uh, we managed to put it together over the weekend. So it's kind of cool. So it would plug in at that moment, at the end of the thing, and when it says the project is under construction, part of the exhibit is also this weird thing that, you know, whatever it is, it's not necessarily clear. Uh, and so it would start from there as it does with the credits, same story, with the blocks, with the elements that are there, the steel by the steel worker that worked on the building, uh, and so forth. And still using this as a sort of... Primo Piano, Primo Piano Numero Due, is our entry into the world built by Smith in 1942. expanded in 1961. By sectioning its space, we developed a digital model for the project's laser cutting, CNC milling, and 3D printing. At the Maxi, 
visitors encounter bas reliefs in an installation that also displays the site's foliage in this video behind a steel stand. A base of blocks from different construction phases and leaves around the site model present our ideas about recycling Smith's workshop factory as a creative universe. That's a touch of gravity that, you know. <clears throat> uh, and, and so uh, in this issue of the dialogue with uh, modernism, which is uh, in a way the subtext of what I showed you, I think, in terms of the dialogue with sculpture, I uh, just want to remind that we did this installation in Albany to reframe this bunch of objects on the plinth that were built by Rockefeller when he became governor and he felt he was Louis XIV, so he wanted this immense plaza with sort of little sculptures and object on top. We wanted to do that and somehow we identified the slab as the key moment in relationship between where the 25,000 workers go without ever being able to emerge on the uh, plaza and this notion of the Corbusian tradition of the cruciform skyscraper. So in reference again with the work of one of the uh, very important uh, sculpture of the 70s that did this project of the, the sectional labyrinth, we basically installed uh, a framing device above and a labyrinth underneath uh, which brings us back to some of those masks uh, and the issue of trying to revert the usual narrative about Icarus, the sun that flies too high and burns the wings because uh, it doesn't want to follow the advice of his dad, the architect. And usually it's considered like a death and a tragedy. Uh, we don't think so. Uh, we think that if you look carefully at the things, uh, one could also say that uh, plunging into the water is accessing an underworld, which uh, you know both through Alice or Cocteau, uh, and we've been uh, made aware that it is a way of accessing language and understanding uh, how things could be done. Thank you. So sorry, guys, I went too long. I hope that the video somehow at least uh, gave a little break from the blah blah. That it's a little bit inevitable. I, was wondering. I, 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 yes, I want to. That's why I'm, I, I hope that you have them. And uh, that was the idea of sort of having it a little bit rambly and with different media and with different kind of projects, both public and private, to hopefully open up uh, some questions. Yes. The sync of voices, but the narrator of your, your um, videos is the most kind of pleasingly neutral voice. I'm wondering what that decision was about. Because even when they're very distinctive radio personalities. Well, that's an odd. Well, I mean, uh, uh, is someone in your office? No, 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 I mean, th th that's the other amazing thing that, you know, as architects, uh, I think we know, but we don't know, that there are these people, I mean, the friends of my daughter, basically, they sort of do this stuff, but nobody knows what it is, which eventually produces this sort of paints or stuff, the ads or the stuff, you, and, you know, they know what they're doing. Ooh, I mean, you know. You give them a footage where you try to do your little animated Photoshop, whatever, blah, 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 and then, you know, and it's just a matter of this post-production stuff that is, is, is unimaginable. I mean, we write the text uh, that has to fit. In fact, the, 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 the teaser about Smith is, is not quite coordinated, let alone a couple of glitches. So there is a certain amount of amazing exercise for us to edit. And you learned, you learned the effectiveness of that through the Queensboro Bridge process. You realize video is a communication tool that, that architects aren't dealing with enough yet, and you, you saw how it... Right. right. Well, it's... Uh, and so a question, too, about um, 
I found it really interesting in your presentation. You started with the agencies that you're working with, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little more about how the work negotiates that. I mean, you also alluded to the fact that we have to make it comprehensible to different audiences through these videos, but is that then informing the way you're thinking about the work? So, like, how does that piece of it kind of fit into the, Is it like you design and then you say, well, we have to make people understand this, or is that always. Oh, the no. Part I mean, the, the, imagine. The video of Oakwood's Plaza was about having somehow measured the limits of the process. And it got built. It's totally cool. However, to get somewhere else, how does one you know, uh, regather consensus, basically, which is the consensus that will address the maintenance, because that's the other issue. It's not the 50 million, it's just 3 million, so 2.5 million, but then they have to make an agreement about how to go there, whether or not. Fortunately, there's LEDs, so the, the filaments don't break down when they try. And there's things that have happened since this project day forever. In any case, no, that, that, that video is just a recycling of the five perspectives that we had in the office. It's just, you know, I mean, all those, I mean, they're just layers of Photoshop. I mean, it's a big deal, I mean, you know. And, and we didn't have anything else. We had a 3D model which we had used in a very reductive way to do perspectives because that's what you end up wasting the amazing power of those digital media. And you know, I mean, teaching economic urban design, which is what I do uh, often, um, I, I, I so I got to the conviction that you know urban projects are too complicated to explain. People lose patience. I mean, well, it, it, that's what, what so, was so great about your showing both a more, let's say, traditionally architectural or, or for architects presentation of the idea before, before you show the video. Because mm -hmm. it makes very two very clearly distinct representations of the same enterprise. Right. But I mean, I think that's extremely clarified, by the way. And if, if, I, if I can offer anything about I think that uh, it, there's a tremendous amount of meat there. Mm -hmm. If you just talk about the Queens Project to architecture school audiences, and you cleave it according to those two mm -hmm. types of presentations, mm -hmm. boy, that by itself is, I think, pretty rich. Uh, yeah. I, th I, I think that's, I, 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 you know, the, I, I, I agree that video is, I mean, it has so many latent advantages to talk about experience that, you know, we've, we've nibbled around the edges of in right. the static world for right. centuries. And uh, it is amazing how much more powerful, or how much more powerfully you can communicate layers of ideas right. In, right. One, in one move. You know, and then there is the footage, you know, based on the photographic indexical thing. That's reality. I mean, you know, <laughs> this footage, I don't know whether you know this, was very Fettuccini homemade, you know, it was kind of complete. But, you know, you know, it was very, very kind of, you know, from the bike, it was a disaster. But, you know, somehow, you know, it, it makes the traffic a real disaster, so it's okay. Another unrelated thing that, that amazingly clear to me is that when projects take forever, and I think almost all these projects take forever, it does allow for the intensity of investigation that the client almost doesn't notice is the job's going on. So, I mean, um, and I, at the Queensboro Bridge Project, the library project, you know, while the, 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 the gears of the bureaucracy are moving like this, you know, you and Linda are still scurrying around at squirrel speed, right. you know, like laying on, laying on things that aren't costing that much more, but a thoughtfulness is able to enter into the process, you know, between schematics and DD. Right. That's kind of an advantage, actually. You know, that you, <coughs> yeah. Uh, you there is less that? margin than you might imagine in the slowness. The slowness kicks in. Uh, Yes, a little bit in the process of design. In the case of the library, dramatically in the uh, process of implementation. That project was bid uh, four, four and a half years ago. <coughs> At that point, Bloomberg decided to change the rules of public bids in order to not to do the 19th century, instead of having you know, the three separate contractor, the structure, the plumbers, and the architecture that then, you know, the general contractor had no interest in negotiating. It was, you know, well to change orders. He said, I'm an efficient guy, so there's one general contractor that is responsible for everything, I want one number, and whatever. 
Unfortunately, he uh, enforced this thing here on a Thanksgiving day, which was uh, the day in which the envelopes of the bid of our project were being opened. So we went back to zero. We had worked very, very hard in getting the DDC to approve the particular integration of structure and structural glass, which is sort of, I didn't speak much about it, but it's very unusual because it just hangs from above, like a real curtain wall. So the fins don't go to the ground, which means that you can walk all around touching the glass over Broadway, and there's nothing that prevents you to do. And because there is no dead load over the sort of cantilever slab, it could be very small uh, as a canopy because it's the main entrance. That had not been done many times, and it requires some finicky thing. And well, I mean, the general contractor low bid everybody because the rule is still you know, the job has to be taken by who bids low, uh, completely under bid because they really wanted to get into the market. I mean, all the other contractors and guys, they, these people are not going to make it. Fine, so they're in best. However, they also wanted to go shop smart. We spent. say six months not to change anything, to defend what otherwise would have been unbuildable if they would have gone shopping in China, which was clearly what they had in mind to do. And, we, and, you, know, and you get this shop drawings in day two, which you know they kind of built, until we found the trick which hits the, the public agencies, which is there's only one test that you whole China structural glass is not certified, uh, which is the, the heat soak test, which is basically the one that verifies that uh, sulfides are eliminated from structural glass. And the presence of sulfides is what makes structural glass self-imploded. So because we had one over the public sidewalk, we say, listen, guys, I mean, you don't want to take that chance that this is going to explode over the sidewalk, right? And so, so no, but so the contractor lost half a million. Senator, we should, we should let the rest of the questions happen down now, I think. Sure. Thank you again very much. Thank you, guys.